welcome to the Becker Auditorium. Um, we moved into this building probably about two years ago now, having been in Vincent Street for I think close on 39 years and spread across um, a range up to five properties. And probably the one thing we never really appreciated when we moved in here was the level of interaction that happens by default across the business from a large foreplate and putting everyone together is huge. And I suspect that's probably partly to do with, you know, in our busy lives, we don't stop often enough to discuss issues casually, run into people on stairwells, have events like we do today, because we're so busy focusing on what's immediately ahead of us. But we do absolutely need to look to the future. Um, Becca today, I've uh, been around about 96 years, about 3,000 staff spread across um, the Asia Pacific region, um, projects in 70 countries. Um, and we've got a lot of clients that have been with us for those for at least half that period of time and that we still work with throughout the region. We've been a, a member of the Sustainable Business Council now for a number of years and before that its predecessor, the New Zealand um, Sustainable Business Council, or Council of Sustainable Development. And over that time what we've seen is a change really from probably what I would say is a lot of pioneers in the, in the climate change or environmental sustainability space to really mainstream business. <laughs> And the point that comes home is when you look at the members you know, on the Sustainable Business Council with me, they're all major corporations, they're all focused on these issues. Um, the world is becoming a much, much smaller place. It's becoming um, much more transparent and therefore it behoves us to really get into these issues and take, and take them seriously as we do. Housekeeping, just quickly for those in Auckland, I won't try and do housekeeping for Wellington. Um, there isn't a test fire alarm for today. If it does go off, sadly, you're going to have to exit into the rain. Out through the doors at the back left and around onto the outdoor courtyard, there is a limited amount of shelter, so be quick. Um, and the toilets are through the doors and slightly around to your left uh, for the male and female toilets. I'd now like to invite Patrick Smelly to the stage to introduce the members of the panel, um, co-owner of the business desk and facilitator for today's discussion. Patrick. Thank you, David. Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I, my job is fairly simple, which is simply to try to, to keep us to time. I just thought I would quickly run over the way that the debate will run. We've, we've put up a, a group of six questions to help frame the debate and also to try to, to uh, give it a, a sufficiently long-term, forward-looking uh, approach. Those are very briefly. We've said, as the Kyoto era winds down, what are the main opportunities and threats for New Zealand as climate change? policy enters a new phase. Is there a, new, is there a role complementary that is non-price measures for New Zealand? What price on carbon should New Zealanders face and are low-cost options available to reduce emissions? If the New Zealand emissions trading scheme continues, how can it deliver on its targets? Does New Zealand want to be an international leader in climate change and is one of the world's most emissions intensive countries? What are the implications for New Zealand's economy longer term for competitiveness and policy? Uh, now, the speakers don't necessarily have to answer all of those questions, but the two discussants who we'll have at the end of the uh, session, Brian Fellow, Economics Editor at the, at the New Zealand Herald, and Dave Frame uh, from the uh, Climate Change Centre, thank you, at Victoria University, um, will we'll, uh, discuss in terms of those questions. So, uh, through a uh, random process, uh, we've determined that the order of speakers will be Kennedy Graham first, Wana Mackey, Tim Grosser, and then Jamie White. And between each speaker, there will be a, an opportunity, a brief opportunity for a bon mot, if you wish to throw one in. Uh, but I will be trying to keep you to time. Uh, we'll have a question and answer session once the um, speakers have finished, and then we'll move to the discussions. So without further ado, I invite Kennedy Graham. <coughs> Thank you for the invitation to, to be here today. Uh, the Green Party sees climate change as the biggest threat to humankind yet faced. Atmospheric carbon concentration is one of the nine planetary boundaries identified by the research community in recent years. It is integrated with the other boundaries, atmospheric ozone, ocean acidification, land use, freshwater use, biodiversity, biogeochemical cycle toxic waste, aerosol loading. If we exceed these boundaries, we jeopardize life on Earth. At present, we're exceeding three. Atmospheric carbon concentration, 
is one. There are various dimensions to this, philosophical, moral, psychological, even existential. I'll focus on the political economic aspects today. The Green Party is perhaps distinct in contending that preventing dangerous climate change is the overarching challenge of our time, the central organizing principle for the global interest and all national interests together. Nothing short of an economic transformation to a low carbon economy by 2050 is required. That will leave about 80% of known fossil fuel reserves in the ground. The extent to which we fall short of that goal is the extent to which we condemn the next generation to a dangerous and highly unpleasant existence on the planet we leave behind. It is in that purposeful context that we critique current and propose alternative policy. It is not alarmist, it is not sensationalist, it is cognizant of the magnitude of the threat and the need for swift action. Climate change has been before the UN Security Council since 2007 as a potential threat to international peace and security. We have been given six questions. My answers reflect this worldview. Question one. As the Kyoto era winds down, what are the main opportunities and threats for New Zealand as climate policy enters a new phase? With respect, I think this is a misconception that the Kyoto era is winding down. Kyoto 1 was simply a pilot run of five years, 08 to 12, confined in time and of modest proportion. Because the Bali Action Plan for a global agreement failed at Copenhagen in 2009, there is a need for Kyoto 2 to run from 2013 to 20. The national government has distracted attention away from our obligation to enter legally binding commitments for this critical decade in favour of a purely voluntary pledge for 2020. That 5% pledge in itself is inadequate. It falls short of New Zealand doing its fair share. Question two, does New Zealand want to be seen internationally as a leader on climate change? No, neither a leader, nor a fast follower, nor a laggard, just a country that does its fair share. A fair share does not mean refusing to take a binding com commitment under Kyoto 2 or claiming we are the only country outside Europe with an ETS when our policy settings are so weak that the scheme results in gross and net emissions increase. Or when we flaunt an agricultural research scheme that will only have an indirect effect over the medium term with no effect in the short term. Question three. If the ETS continues, how can it deliver on its targets? The question begs what the targets are. Do we mean National's 5% target for 2020, or its refusal to set a target for 2030, or its 50% target for 2050, where other countries have specified carbon neutrality as early as 2030? The fact is that current government policy is inadequate to meet its ina inadequate targets. If we accept the UN prescribed range for the two degree threshold, that is emission cuts of 25 to 40% for Annex 1 countries by 2020 off 1990, then New Zealand has a massive challenge, whatever policy package it uses. The Green Party always favoured a carbon tax. No policy mechanism is perfect, market or fiscal. But given the planet is at stake, we figure the precautionary principle agreed at Rio in 92 and largely ignored since might apply. Yet if the faint market signals of our current ETS are left to work their perverse incentives, our emissions will, as projected, continue to soar. If the ETS were ever to work, it would require a one-for-one -one obligation, a ring fencing of cheap Kyoto offsets some time back, restrictions on Zen NZU gifting, and the phased introduction of agriculture. But the Green Party has concluded that the ETS in this country cannot easily be made to work. The current government has virtually killed it off. The ETS needs to be put out of its misery and a carbon tax introduced. That would start at $25 for carbon, $12.50 for methane and nitrous oxide from the dairy sector, 1250 tax on carbon from deforestation and a 1250 credit for forest sequestration. The 1.141 billion 
fiscal revenue collected would be recycled to the household through a $2,000 tax free threshold and the private sector through a 1% corporate tax cut. Question four. What price on carbon should New Zealanders face and are low cost options available to reduce emissions? New Zealand should have whatever price is needed to ensure its fair share in global reductions. Given the absence of a single uniform global price to date and into the foreseeable future, we have to make a judgment call on today's national price. The NZU price is near the bottom of the international price range, which is why we are seen as laggards. $3.80 two, I think, today. The Green Party judges $25 New Zealand dollars to be the appropriate starting price. But we would establish an independent climate commission along the lines of the British model to set the interim targets and the capped budgets necessary for our goal of carbon neutrality by 2050. And the commission would then propose the best policy settings, including the most effective low cost pathway to that goal from our initial settings. Question five, is there a role for complementary non-price measures in New Zealand? Yes, of course. Most economists estimate that at least half the mitigation will be through measures that are complementary to the economic instrument. In the Green Climate Protection Package, we have developed a series of such measures. In energy, we have a renewable target of 100% by 2030. We'll establish New Zealand power to low house lower household prices by $300 a year. Our solar homes plan offers low-cost loans. We have a solar school scheme. We'll incentivise the fledgling biofuels sector. We'll strengthen the RMA to prevent new coal mines. We'll extend the heat smart insulation program to another 200,000 homes. In green transport, we'll switch $10 billion of the $15 billion currently planned away from new roads and onto public transport, while keeping road maintenance at current levels. We'll incentivise electric and hybrid cars. We'll promote rail and coastal freight. In finance, we'll establish the Green Investment Bank. We'll remove oil subsidies and raise royalties. And we'll boost R&D. For the farms and forests, we'll introduce a farm certification scheme for riparian planting and fencing, soil and fertiliser management and manure management. We'll promote permanent forestry, including for iwi will promote pest control for native forests. Question six. What are the implications for our economy's long-term competitiveness? New Zealand is one of the most emissions-intensive countries in the entire world. If we do not commence the transition to a low-carbon economy very fast, we are going to be stranded, both economically and politically. There will be a global agreement Voluntary contributions will soon transform back to legally binding commitments. A global carbon price will emerge and it will rise. The global economy will start to seriously transform over the next decade. We cannot afford to be left behind. We shall plan for optimal equity between sectors in the economic transformation. We in the Green Party love our country and respect the planet. This requires not only a clean environment, but a smart economy. We're all in this together, public sector and private sector. We need inspired leadership, rational policy, and social cohesion. We invite you to be with us on the journey. Thank you, Kennedy. Uh, there is an opportunity for the Bon Mo. If anybody would like to take it. In that case, I'll ask Moana Mackey, Labor's uh, climate change spokesperson. Um, thank you to Business New Zealand for organising this forum and for the invitation to speak here today. I also want to thank John Carnegie and members of Business New Zealand who have engaged with me since I picked up the climate change portfolio two and a half years ago. We haven't always agreed, but the feedback from your varied perspectives and sectors has been enormously helpful and it has been much appreciated. I have the dubious honour of being the only Member of Parliament to have sat on every Emissions Trading Scheme Select Committee since the scheme was introduced by the last Labor Government. So while it would be very easy for me to simply stand here and bemoan the lack of progress in the area of climate change policy, 
I feel it is important to acknowledge that in many ways things have moved in a positive direction since the ferocious and largely unhelpful debate back in 2007-2008. Firstly, and most importantly, we now have broad acceptance across Parliament and society that anthropogenic climate change is real and that we need to do something about it. It might not seem like a big deal, but that first ETS Select Committee was more about that basic debate than it was about anything else. We now have greater cross-party support for action on climate change, however shallow that may be. We have bipartisan support between Labor and National for an emissions trading scheme as a preferred mechanism to price carbon. And we have industry and agriculture looking for ways to reduce or offset emissions and a willingness to engage constructively with political parties who want to see a greater priority placed on our transition to a low-carbon economy. New Zealand is one of the worst greenhouse gas polluters on a per capita basis, and this does have implications for the New Zealand economy's longer term competitiveness. Crucially, however, there does seem to be a growing understanding that this is as much an economic issue as it is an environmental one. This is about future-proofing our economy. It's not a nice to have. This is a transition we have to make. Labor started that transition when we were last in government through measures including the price on carbon and placing a moratorium on any new baseload thermal electricity generation and introducing a biofuels obligation. We would make it a priority again. The longer we leave it, the more difficult and expensive it will be and we miss a window of opportunity to leverage our natural abilities and strengths in a world that will soon be crying out for low carbon technologies, goods and services. We need a comprehensive climate change strategy which includes setting a price on carbon, but isn't solely restricted to that. Up to this point, it is felt as though the ETS is the be-all and end-all of climate change policy, and I believe the almost exclusive focus by politicians and others over the last decade on the rights and wrongs of the ETS has meant that the focus on complementary measures such as energy efficiency or transport vehicle emission standards hasn't been as strong as it could have been. What is needed is a combination of a price on carbon and sector-specific emission reduction and mitigation policies across the economy. This is particularly important for the agricultural sector, given the obligation point is set at the processor level. We need to find ways to reward good behaviour that otherwise gets lost in the averaging out. If climate change policies are not coordinated, there can be no expectation that they will actually achieve emissions reductions targets that have been set. So as well as the targets, we need a plan of how to get there. Proper carbon budgeting will take emission reduction targets, assess the lowest cost options available and set an overall plan for achieving them. That is what is missing right now. The current government's target of reducing our emissions by 5% below 1990 levels by 2020 is set to be overshot by 33% based on official figures and 15% when you factor in mitigation by forestry. What is the point of setting a target if you have no intention of even showing a passing interest in achieving it? So as the Kyoto era winds down, what are the main opportunities and threats for New Zealand as climate policy enters a new phase? The main threat is the impacts of climate change, including severe and frequent, more severe and frequent storms, droughts and other adverse weather events, and the expected impact on low-lying and coastal communities due to sea level rises and coastal erosion needs to be assessed. Central government must proactively work with and support local government to identify our most vulnerable regions and develop adaptation plans that allow a measured, well thought out response to climate threats rather than a last minute panic. Central government's role is crucial given that councils that are attempting to address this issue are at risk of, or are already facing, legal action. And one threat that doesn't often get mentioned is biosecurity. We all understand the importance of being vigilant about organisms coming across our borders that could devastate our primary industries or impact human health. But what about those pests, those diseases or transmission vectors that are already in the country, that are benign at current temperatures, but may not be quite so harmless with a few degrees of warming? As a small exporting nation, the impact of climate change on our international trading partners is also a threat. It would be simplistic for us to think that just because the effects of climate change may be greater in other parts of the world, thereby reducing their ability to produce food and potentially increasing demand for our products, that this is a net win for New Zealand. Economies in chaos really make for stable, reliable trading partners, and climate change has already been identified as one of the greatest threats to global security. However, there are also enormous opportunities for New Zealand in supporting the development of renewable and low-carbon products and marketing them to the world. Companies such as Carbonscape in Marlborough, which uses microwave technology to turn wood waste into charcoal, are world first, are just quietly getting on with the job. 
but the potential for these industries is incredibly exciting if the government showed a much greater enthusiasm for supporting their growth and development. At the moment, we risk being overtaken by countries like Denmark, who have realised the enormous economic potential that exists, as well as the environmental benefits. And we also have an opportunity now to turn around the sorry picture in the carbon forestry sector by restricting the cheap international units that have flooded into the ETS, as well as phasing out the two-for-one surrender obligation subsidy and bringing agriculture into the scheme, both of which would significantly expand the market for NZUs. This would also address iwi concerns regarding promises made to them about the restriction of international units, the flood of which have disproportionately impacted their interests, especially where NZUs form part of their treaty settlement. No one wants a protracted fight in the Waitangi Tribunal over an issue that is so easily remedied. We need to be planting trees now to offset our increasing emissions and the mass harvesting we know is coming. In this area, New Zealand is currently extremely exposed internationally. Up until now, our growing gross emissions have been offset by forestry. Many of those forests are due to be harvested in the next 10 to 15 years. At that point, the cost of growing emissions that the current government has managed to avoid will become a major liability for a 2020s government. Given the long tail of investment for forestry and the time lapse between carbon sequestration being of any value, we need to be planning for this now rather than once again waiting for the inevitable but last minute panic. To this end, it remains Labor's preference to price carbon via an emissions trading scheme. If operating as intended, it provides incentives for forestry, as well as sending a price signal to advantage low carbon goods and services. It was working when we were in government, and we believe it can be made to work again. Crucially, it is the system we already have, and it enjoys bipartisan support between Labor and National, something that should not be discarded lightly. <coughs> Through all the ETS Select Committee processes, the one thing everyone agreed on, no matter what side of the debate they came down on, was the need for far greater stability. Labor believes fixing the existing scheme is the best way of achieving that. In terms of what carbon price we would like to see, we would let the market set the price, but note that forestry participants have indicated a price of $15 would provide the incentive that they need to get trees in the ground. We would continue our policy of 90% free allocation with five yearly reviews informing the phase out of that free allocation. Our climate, just like any other aspect of our environment, does not turn on a dime. Climate change policy needs long-term sustainable thinking and planning and as much cross-party support as possible. It also needs buy-in from the community and business. I would hope there is no one in this room who thinks that doing things the way we've always done them and not responding to increasing global demands for sustainable goods and services is the smartest way forward for New Zealand. The debate needs to shift from whether we make this transition to how we make it. And while environmental NGOs are to be, to be congratulated for raising awareness of climate change and sustainability issues and bringing these issues into the political and public arena, they are not the people who are going to take the New Zealand economy through this transition. Those people are in this room. They are the business people, entrepreneurs, innovators, sci innovators scientists, tradespeople and workers of New Zealand. So that brings me to the last question we were asked to address. Does New Zealand want to be seen internationally as a leader on climate change? I certainly think we can do far better than the current situation, where I have heard New Zealand referred to as an apathetic bystander and, the one that really hurt, a freeloader. If committing to transitioning away from a carbon intensive economy and showing a transparent plan on how we intend to do that, if investing in R&D, if supporting Pacific neighbours to not only help them adapt to climate change but in good faith show that we are prepared to reduce our own emissions, if supporting the carbon forestry sector, if supporting the renewable energy and clean technology sectors, and if fixing the ETS earns us kudos on the international stage and helps bolster and repair brand New Zealand, then that's great. But that's not why we're doing it. We're doing it because it's the sensible thing to do, environmentally and economically. If my experience on successive ETS select committees has taught me anything, it's that if we wait for the right time to do this, we'll be waiting forever. There will always be a reason not to do it right now. But the transition to a low carbon economy is a transition we must make. This is about future proofing our economy and the sooner we start, the easier that transition will be. Thank you. Thank you, Juana. Um, can I just ask, is there any reaction from the panel at this stage? Uh, we're going to move to the handheld mics for the rest of the session. Um, apparently the fidelity into the Wellington uh, office is not as good as it should be. Um, so I'll hand over to Tim. You, it's up to you whether you want to head for the lectern or stay where you are. 
No, I think uh, it's very com comfortable sitting here and I've got this vast array of notes that I can draw on more easily in front of me. Let me just uh, also thank you very much for putting on uh, this, uh, this political opportunity for all, all of us as candidates uh, to present our different perspectives. And I also want to acknowledge uh, Becca. I've uh, been associated with your company for many years now, more in the area of trade. I've worked particularly with Becca in Indonesia 20 years ago, uh, and uh, you're just a great company, and I think it's a direction I want to see a lot more New Zealand services exporters take. On, on the issue, look, uh, I uh, um, appear to be working off an earlier iteration of the questions. I don't think it'll make any uh, big difference, Patrick, uh, but um, I am uh, also will stick to trying to actually answer the questions and uh, I think fair, uh, consistent with my predecessors, not just uh, make uh, political comments. So the first question I had in front of me was about the fifth assessment report and the question was, um, taking the IPCC's description of the scientific dimensions, how big a problem have we got? Well, we've got a, a massive uh, global problem. Uh, Ross Garneau, the author of the first of the major Australian uh, policy uh, recommendation reports, described it as the single most complex international problem facing uh, the mankind. Uh, we know that from 1750 through to 2010, around about 40% of the increase in anthropogenic greenhouse gases have come in the last 40 years. CO2 is overwhelmingly still the main problem. It's 80% of the stock of the gas. And of course, it's the long, long life gas. Um, there's an interesting but essentially academic debate as to whether or not um, we've added unnecessary complexity in the original design of Kyoto uh, by not focusing all the efforts on carbon dioxide. Uh, but that's, as I say, essentially academic. So we have a, a very serious problem. And I mean, the obvious policy takeaways to me are, number one, it is a global problem, and we therefore need a global response. And if you ask me to make an assessment, um, as a personal assessment, about w where should we be really focusing on? Well, my, my answer would be, since it is a global problem, we need to focus overwhelmingly on trying to contribute to a global solution. Now, this does have a component to it. I mean, the climate change skeptics would not accept this, of doing something about our emissions. But, you know, I will come back to a, a really, uh, I think, pertinent comment made in the uh, report put together by Sir Peter Gluckman and a group of New Zealand scientists, which if I can quote it to you, um, to me, absolutely nails the point. Quote, New Zealand's net greenhouse gas emissions represent but a minute fraction of global emissions. Any action from New Zealand to mitigate emissions would have a negligible direct global impact in real terms. Therefore, New Zealand's contribution should be to reduce emissions. It is more of a geopolitical issue. So this is not an argument about not doing anything. But it is a very strong argument about keeping some perspective on our own emissions and the question about how much action we should take. I mean, if I'm listening to Ken, who's a former colleague of mine um, uh, in, in MFAP, sat opposite in offices in Geneva for about three years together, and uh, we get on extremely well on a personal level, uh, Ken's and the Green Party's position would be to put almost all priorities just on reducing New Zealand emissions. Whereas our position is actually there is no point to this unless it is geared to a larger global effort. And secondly, while this is not accepted by some of my political colleagues here, there are, in my opinion, very few low-hanging fruit in this area for New Zealand. There are very few opportunities to make quick cuts in our, um, uh, our, our, in our, not our net emissions, but our gross emission, without actually imposing serious economic costs on New Zealand companies and on New Zealand households. So, you know, we are a party which has multiple objectives. The, we're the walk and chew gum at the same time party, and we are trying to achieve multiple objectives which can conflict. Uh, Second thing I'd say, again, from a global response, is um, I think we're already seeing, and this is an encouraging thing, 
uh, a very important sea change in terms of technology, clean technologies. Uh, if you, uh, I, I quickly consulted the AR5 before coming down here just to check a couple of stats. And one of the stats that I think is extremely encouraging from the I latest IPCC report is that in 2012, slightly over 50% of all new electricity generation capacity was in renewable energy, and that excludes nuclear. I mean, that is, a, that is a big shift when you think that the OECD average for renewable electricity is a little under 10%. I mean, we're sitting up there 74, 75% of electricity. Norway's the world leader on 90%. Uh, Australia's 8%. So, you know, there are signs of a very important shift here towards renewable energy, and it's helped enormously by the open trading system, which is leading China in particular to drive costs down the average cost curve and making it competitive without subsidies with fossil fuel production. So there's one point of um, optimism there. I think also we're seeing um, huge improvements in buildings. I'm sorry to get very specific as opposed to rhetorical about this problem, but buildings are one third of global energy. And we have seen, even with retrofits, uh, increases in energy efficiency that are absolutely stupendous, between 50 and 90 percent, even with retrofits, according to the uh, AR5 report. And as so many new buildings are being built in the emerging economies of the world, led by China, I think there is really an opportunity here to advance investment in clean tech energy. One of the things that influenced me, Patrick, a lot uh, was this large brain in international climate change negotiation called uh, Dr. Jonathan Pershing, who's an American physicist and was deputy negotiator for the United States team until he went across to energy. And he says, what we're really trying to do in the next 20 years is not draw a straight line between aggregate emissions here and the two degrees target, but curve the line by getting clean tech investment into place globally and then we will see a very rapid reduction in, as those numbers do imply. Uh, and if you look at New Zealand's, I mean, I personally believe our biggest problem is not agriculture. I'll come to agriculture in a minute. I mean, that's our biggest problem in, in numeric terms, but being 49.4% of our emissions. But our biggest problem is transport. And uh, I mean, we're a long, skinny country, the size of the United Kingdom with four and a half million people. And sure, there's absolutely a role for improved um, public transport facilities, but New Zealanders are going to use cars, and we're a technology importer. Of course, at the same time, I'm aware, as anyone who reads Bloomberg New Energy Finance like me knows, that every single car manufacturer in the world is investing seriously into a different mix. It varies company by company. Uh, some are into hybrids, some are into pure electricity cars, and so on and so forth. So, you know, New Zealand is the perfect country in the world for electric cars once somebody else <laughs> has developed cost-competitive electric vehicles or hybrid vehicles, as well as seeing continual, uh, obviously, because we could then recharge them at, in, the, in the evenings with our massive re um, renewable energy. And by the way, in terms of consented projects, 99% of new electricity consented projects in New Zealand are renewable. So we should be optimistic we can get to this 90% figure. Now, the next question was, uh, I have to be very disciplined here, Kyoto era winding down. Well, actually, I do agree. I don't uh, go with Ken on this one. And, and the fundamental reason is because we need a global response. So the Kyoto Agreement was fractured brutally from the very beginning by the decision of the United States Senate to vote it down 95 to 0. Um, all over the issue fundamentally about the non-participation of China, uh, a, a political equation that is still even larger today. And it now accounts for 11% of emissions. So with 89% of emissions outside the Kyoto, it's essential we look to a, gl uh, a global response. And the decision that I recommended to our cabinet and was endorsed uh, not to put our second commitment under the Kyoto Convention, even though we're actually cut copying and pasting the Kyoto rules for all practical purposes, we, we could have done it, was at the end of the day a decision of principle because what I could see at the international level was this constant demand for Kyoto, <coughs> Kyoto, 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 was essentially 
a device to divert attention back to a small group of developed countries responsible, as I say, for 11% of emissions and avoid the main problem. And even today, we're still well short here. I mean, if you look at the Cancun pledges, over 100 countries haven't even said they're going to do anything. And they, their emissions are twice the total emissions from Europe. So the number one thing we need is a higher level of global response. We don't need to get every country involved in it, but we need something like a Pareto optimization approach, you know, 80-20 principle, and we need investment. I'm not pessimistic on either of those counts, uh, Patrick, but it is going to take a little bit of time. Um, in terms of the price, well, you know, uh, the, the, pr the question given to me, what price on carbon should New Zealanders face? Well, uh, that's almost a philosophical question, isn't it? I mean, what price of milk should New Zealanders face? My answer, and the answer of people that support the political philosophy that I represent, is the market price. Now, yes, there is more than one market price for milk, and there's more than one market price for carbon. I get it. But they are linked. The carbon prices are linked in terms of a large aggregation around a certain figure, and I don't want to see our people paying more than the world price. You know, there's, in economics, there's a, there's, a, there's a thing called the difference between declared preferences and revealed preferences. Declared preferences are what people respond to journalists and pollsters about what they think they should be saying. Declared preferences what they do. And there is a massive gap, ladies and gentlemen, between revealed and declared preferences here. The reality is that in 2013, the World Bank estimated that only 7% of emissions globally are covered by some type of carbon price or tax, okay? So, you know, I don't want us um, paying a far higher price than our competitors. Uh, in terms of uh, should we keep an emissions training scheme, I strongly agree with Moana Mackey uh, on this, and I think this is um, underappreciated inside the wider political community beyond the two major political parties. Uh, having um, agreement between the two major political parties on structure is, frankly, a very important political achievement. And I agree with her. My own subjective assessment would be the same, that there's been an evolution in a helpful direction of community attitudes to this, what was regarded um, particularly among some of my supporters as, you know, the end of the world is nigh stuff. I think we've bedded that down. And when I look across the Tasman and see the political disaster across the Tasman from chopping and changing between carbon taxes and emissions trading schemes, I think you've got all the lessons you ever want. You know, and you can put it in political terms. It has destroyed the political careers of three, you know, very fine political leaders in Australia. Kevin Rudd, Tony, uh, uh, <laughs> that might be a slip of tongue. <laughs> Ke well, that's, that's for the future, okay. <laughs> Kevin Rudd. Julia Gillard and um, Malcolm Turnbull, the leader of the Australian Liberal Party, who lost to uh, the current Prime Minister by one vote in caucus over whether he, the Liberal Party, should support the Labour Party's emissions trading scheme. Well, and by another, the CPRS was the title, but it's the same concept as our scheme. So, I'm sorry, you throw away structure at your peril in politics if you want to move a society forward. We can have an arm wrestle amongst us about the speed of the transition, but to change the structure, in my opinion, is reckless. Uh, the next question, have I got what, two minutes more? Uh, yes, I'll, I'll give you one. One, well, let me, let me um, deal on agriculture because, you know, I, I, I said something quite provocative. Actually, I don't think this is the fundamental problem. It is a fundamental problem in terms of a box ticking exercise which uses the metrics of Kyoto based on country uh, emissions. Why? Because we produce other people's food. So 49 point for say 50% of our emissions are from agriculture, but the reality is New Zealand is the most carbon efficient major agricultural producer in the world. I mean, there are numerous estimates to prove this point. Uh, the FAO whole of carbon cycle estimate of a dairy, milk, uh, dairy carbon cycle uh, in terms of the carbon uh, CO2e used per kilogram of milk solids, put the average, not the high end, the average two and a half times New Zealand's. And we are improving that by about 1.3% on a compound average basis every year. So we, I mean, uh, one of our uh, agricultural uh, scientists said yesterday 
this is Professor Kemp at Massey University, to me this is ex exactly my view, quote, some people say why not just decrease the number of sheep and cattle in New Zealand? I cannot see the logic in this approach. The demand for meat and milk will not go away. Somewhere else in the world will pick up the slack and the planet will be no better off. And to quote, well, I mean, I think he's wrong when he says the world would be no better off. The world will be worse off because that will raise carbon emissions if, we'd, if we reduce our production and are replaced by higher carbon intense production. Now, on the Global Research Alliance, you know, the best kept secret in, in New Zealand politics, nobody wants to talk about it, but it's a huge success. And I had a group of New Zealand scientists around my table just yesterday having a blue skies discussion of where we take the alliance next. I mean, there's serious progress being made. Only a few months ago, they cracked the method methanogen that produces enteric methane. Read this publication, it's outstanding. I've been handing it around the world as I've gone around recently. So far, the evidence indicates they've got a 1,300 uh, flock uh, for research purposes now. They're on the cusp now of starting to make practical recommendations about how to breed for lower enteric methane, which is 34% of New Zealand's emissions. So, ladies and gentlemen, you know, my approach in summary is this is a serious problem. Secondly, I don't believe for one minute that the answer lies in some dramatic upgrading of New Zealand's res policy response when only 7% of global emissions are covered by a price. Number three, I think, along with Moana Mackey, that we've got the right structure in place. I accept that at current carbon price, this Rolls-Royce policy machine is inching down the green highway at a very slow speed, but we can speed that up when we see a more logical response globally. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. Kennedy, I... I Can I just ask you to pass that uh, mic on down to Kennedy Graham, who was very restrained and spent, used his 10 minutes, exactly at 10 minutes, and therefore should get a couple more now. <laughs> Thank you. This, this is working, right? So, um, yeah, well, thanks for that. Let's just uh, reciprocate to Tim in terms of my personal regard for him and, and his competence and, and personal integrity, and then focus on areas where we disagree on policy. Um, <laughs> and uh, let's not... <laughs> right behind you. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, and let's not, let's not uh, conclude from the last speaker that National and Labour are um, Siamese twins on climate policy, but I'll leave that to Moana. Um, uh, the, the, the points of policy disagreement, um, uh, and I'll just confine them to uh, 100. Um, the first one is that Tim and his government, and it was reiterated today, um, rest the rationale for New Zealand not to do what he calls a, dr a dramatic and drastic upgrade of climate policy on the grounds that A, we're tiny and negligible was the word used, and that we can therefore contribute to global emission reductions without necessarily having to reduce our emissions nationally. And uh, if, even if one were to agree in logic, and I don't, um, it would still possibly come across in some people's perceptions as self-serving argumentation. But I don't agree in logic for the following reason. The world, the global, the international community which negotiates on climate change is divided into 193 UN member states, 195 contracting parties to the 92 Framework Convention on Climate Change. It's 195. We all accepted formally binding legal national obligations, national obligations to cut. You can't just shuck off a national legal obligation to do something on the grounds that we'll all adopt a global methodology, a global policy by which we do this, when it becomes demonstrably clear that that global policy is not working to meet your national legal obligations. What I mean by that is, post-92, and in 97 with Kyoto, and then the Marrakesh Accords, and then the setting up of the ETSs, the underlying methodological premise that's there, you'll see it in the Cabinet Papers, the Treasury Papers, is global least cost pathway. And that, of course, is everybody's vision, 
since 1992. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist today in 2014. And it won't exist until you get a deep and liquid global market, to quote a colleague, I know, which won't happen until the 2020s. So in the meantime, we have to undertake, there is an international price range that goes from $3 Kiwi, which is what? Uh, $3.82 today, what's that? $2.50 or $2, two, euro, two euro? Up to around about 50 US to more, depending on particularly which sector and which commodity you identify in terms of a carbon price and tax. So we're, we're right down the bottom of the international price range. And then we have the goal to say we're negligible, it doesn't matter, we'll contribute through agriculture to a global solution. While we watch our emissions go up 25% gross over 20 years and 88% net when you don't do Kyoto accounting, you do net to net, 1990 to 2012, 88% and then we rationalise it along the lines, we're negligible. Negligibility was not the underlying premise of Gallipoli. Thanks, Kennedy. Jamie uh, White from ACT. Could, could uh, I just... Or, or you, or you, sorry, OK, sorry. good, heating up. <laughs> no, no, I, I mean, I, I just wanted to follow on from Kennedy uh, and make a, make a more general point, which, which is, as I've had these portfolios of environment, climate change and science, one thing has come up time and time again, and that is, as Kiwis, we are incredibly short-term thinkers. Uh, when it comes to the environment, whether it's in terms of water quality and energy efficiency, where we'll buy products that we know are going to cost us more in the long term, but because they're cheaper in the short term, we go down that path. Uh, you see it in climate change policy. You even see it outside of my portfolios uh, in areas like the sustainability of NZ Super. We are not long-term thinkers, and that is a problem. And so when I look at an issue like climate change, I look at it from not just the perspective that's been um, debated here today, but also from our own best interests. This is going to happen to us. There is going to be a post-2020 agreement, most likely. We should be preparing for that, because when you look at the carbon budget right now, there is a fiscal cliff because of the deforestation and the harvesting that we know is coming that we are going to ram up against if we don't prepare for it. So instead of doing what we always do, and you know, part of that is, is a three-year electoral cycle, which is enormously unhelpful. Part of it, I suspect, is we're just a young country. Ten years seems like a long time to a New Zealander. It doesn't if you go to Europe. But... It is impacting on our ability to, for, to make good decisions, to, make, uh, to, to, to do them sensibly, to make them well thought out, rather than doing what we always do, which is kind of like being the student that watches Oprah all week and then panics studies on the last night and therefore probably doesn't make the kind of decisions that they would have made had they started from Monday. So from our perspective, this is about long-term planning. And whilst I, I, you know, I, I, I've heard what Tim said a number of times, reiterated, the fact is we don't have the time to just crawl along this green highway and then put our foot down and hope for the best when we come up against the fiscal cliff that we know is coming. It is coming regardless of what we do right now. So we should be, as much as possible, reducing that risk and doing what we can and preparing so that we are best placed post-2020 to not only be able to, to join a, a, a new international agreement, but take advantage also of those economic opportunities that I spoke of before. Thanks, Juana. Uh, I, if somebody else doesn't ask it in q and I, 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 I think I will. Uh, I'd, I'd be keen to hear from both you and Kennedy as to how you square the circle of a carbon tax and an ETS, uh, given that you're presumably going to be uh, coalition partners in government. I'd, but let's, let's not go there now. Uh, just Maybe just give that some thought. Uh, Jamie White. Oh, thank you. Uh, before I get on to explaining ACT's position on um, carbon taxes and ETS and so on, I'd just like to put in a good word for short-term thinking. Um, short-term thinking, uh, some studies have shown that businesses that engage mainly in short-term thinking over the long term do better than companies that think about the long term. And the reason is that, of course, you don't know what's going to happen in the long term, and if you make great punts on the long term, you often find that you go wrong. It's much easier to guide your actions on your short-term expectations than on your long-term ones, and that's a good long-term strategy to adopt. Now, <coughs> let's get on to climate change. ACT... Uh, is probably the only party, I'm not sure about New Zealand First and the Conservatives, that don't want a piece of all of this. Uh, that's to say we don't want the government imposing any costs on uh, emitters of greenhouse gases. Now, I'll explain why that is. To think it's a good idea to, to impose costs on 
greenhouse gas emitters, you have to believe three things. Uh, the first is that emissions are causing the climate to change. The second is that those changes are on net harmful. And the third is that by imposing costs on emitters, you will reduce emissions. You have to believe all of those three things. Now, they are in reverse order. The, the first claim is that, that carbon emissions are ch changing the climate is subject to some uncertainty. Uh, the scientific consensus seems to be that it's, the claim is true. Uh, but it is worth bearing in mind that climate science is an immature science with, even by its own reckoning, uncertain results. Uh, but we can accept the, let's, for the sake of argument, and to not be accused of being a crank uh, or a nutcase of some kind or a denier, let's just accept the climate science because there's absolutely no need uh, to dispute it, to, to arrive at the act conclusion. Now the second, the second thing you have to believe is that climate change, the way the climate is changing, is on net harmful. Now. One of the reasons I think this common idea is, is very popular is that the IPCC, by their own, own admission, pay no attention to the benefits of uh, a warming climate. And it's worth noting that there are many, many serious benefits. I mean, great swathes of land that are not now arable would become arable. That wouldn't necessarily be a great benefit to New Zealand, but uh, it is a globe, at a global level, that's a benefit. Food prices would probably fall in a warming climate. Energy use may well fall. Uh, but the problem is, by admission of the IPC, this IPCC, there's been almost no study of this because, uh, and I'll quote from the latest report, however, it must be said that potential gains have not been well documented, in part because of a lack of stakeholder concern in such cases and subsequent lack of special funding. So there's no money in researching the gains. Uh, but they are there. It's also a tendency to exaggerate uh, the costs. For example, it's frequently s said, and we heard it here today, that uh, the climate change is increasing the frequency of storms, severe weather events, floods, droughts, and so on. But again, the IPC has actually come out and said that it isn't. There's no such evidence. It isn't having those effects. Uh, so it is, it's worth bearing in mind that it may well be that the the effects of it are not as detrimental as commonly thought. And here's something to bear in mind. I if, it, if it happens, if it plays out as it does, there'll be bad effects, such as, let's say, rising sea levels, which, can be adapt which we can adapt to, especially if they happen over a very long period of time. In fact, they can be adapted to at relatively low cost. So, for example, suppose sea levels rise and over, a very, like, say, over 100 years, it's, you can adapt at almost no uh, incremental cost because, for example, when you come to replace buildings, instead of replacing them at the front of the city, so to speak, by the sea, you replace them at the back of the city at higher altitudes. So this goes on uh, over time, and the, the costs may be less, again, than are, than are thought. Now, so there is some... And then, of course, you get the benefits and you adapt to the downside, and so the net effect is actually beneficial. But all of those things are really, in a way... Um, just background data. No, again, there's no need even to worry about that to realize that we shouldn't impose costs on uh, emitters. And that's because imposing costs on them will not reduce emissions. Now, Tim's already explained why this is the case, let's say, in, in the case of dairy. If we followed the Greens policy and imposed a, a, an emissions tax on dairy farmers, uh, the what would happen is that production of dairy would shift overseas. That is quite right. That is what would happen. Dairy production here would become less profitable. It would become comparatively more profitable overseas. There'd be less production here, more production there. Since we are a low-emitting producer, the net effect on emissions is to increase them. Now, let's generalize this. You need to generalize this problem. If a country such as New Zealand or the UK or whoever it might be unilaterally imposes costs on their emitters, all that will happen is that production or emissions will shift elsewhere. There'll be no net, there'll be no reduction in emissions. You, if you can't get a very, very widespread agreement, you're not going to have any effect acting unilaterally. 
and widespread agreement has, has proved extremely difficult to get. Now, this isn't for some accidental reason. This isn't just because people are willfully unpleasant. Well, maybe that they're willfully unpleasant. But the point is it's, it's more or less unavoidable. And now there are two reasons for this. One is that the incentives to break ranks are massive. If you are a, a country that can benefit from break, breaking ranks in agreement, you, in, in the upside, if everybody else is sticking to it, the upside could be potentially huge as production investment flows dramatically into your country and you have a massive advantage over everybody else who's effectively you know, tying their own feet together. That's one reason. The second reason is that countries face completely different trade-offs between economic development and environmental concerns. As a country gets richer, its population tends to value the environment more. And the trade-off that they make between the next increment, let's say, of wealth and the degradation of their environment, it, it changes. They become willing, less willing to accept a degraded environment for the next increment of wealth. That's partly because they're so wealthy that there's a diminishing, <coughs> diminishing value of the next increment. Poorer countries, the Chinese and so on, who are in the throes of development, they make a rather different trade-off. Uh, they, they want, they're willing to sacrifice more environment for the next bit of progress because they're a lot poorer than we are to start with. And so it's very, very difficult to find any agreement because people are facing extremely different trade-offs. Now, while that is true that, that there are no, there's no real prospect in the foreseeable future of international commitments on this, what New Zealand does is simply to shoot itself in the foot with the effect of transferring production to places that are more carbon intensive, so we actually damage the environment, all for the sake of making a gesture, a gesture of caring, a gesture of caring which actually does more harm than good. So uh, we enact consider it a kind of moral exhibitionism. Not, it's not serious concern for the environment. It's not serious concern for the people of China and so on. And we're dead against it. Jamie. Can I provoke a reaction out of the, of the panel at this ju juncture? <laughs> Can I whip, whip that down to, to Kennedy, just make sure that it's on? Just need to push it up. Um, well, I don't know who I'm speaking on behalf of here other than um, the Green Party. But, um, and, and I think a lot of it um, was a surprising lack of logical rigor as we uh, reasoned our way through. But setting that aside as well, I would just simply make one point. Dairy income is not the beginning and end of New Zealand's economic future, any more than fossil fuels are. It is possible to have an economic transformation to a green economy without slavishly flogging our land for extra milk powder to ship off to China. It's not the elixir of New Zealand's trade and economic fortune in the future. I'm not sure, with respect, Jamie, whether you're, you know the figures. The current break-even point for dairy farms, the median farm, is New Zealand dollars $5.64. The top 10% of the farms, it's 4.79. The bottom 10% is $6.96. The, ta the, ca the, carbon, the green carbon tax would have an incentive on changing behaviour in terms of emissions, but it would, at, on current milk prices, not drive even the lowest decile to the wall. And, th and that's really all that needs to be said right now. One could go on. Uh, well, I'm trying to exercise self-restraint here, but um, I'm sorry on that issue. First of all, Ken, uh, it is 34% of New Zealand exports. Secondly, you haven't addressed the issue as to why you think that will help global climate when it will drive production into less carbon efficient countries. And finally, we believe the Burl statistics on which you uh, made your estimates are um, serious underestimates. Uh, we've looked at them very carefully and we think you are grossly misunderstanding, uh, you are underestimating the impact of a $12.50 
uh, carbon tax on New Zealand's number one or third of our exports. Uh, you haven't allowed for any principal repayments, you've underestimated interest payments, and there's a whole series of other technical objections. Um, I just want to make one point which I disagree with. Um, um, I obviously have a completely different read of the science to Jamie from ACT Party. Uh, but just on one technical point, there is in my mind a difference between putting a price on carbon on biological emissions, and let us just deal with one canard here, Agriculture is within the ETS in certain respects. Every agriculture processing company above a certain threshold level or size is in the ETS and has to account for their emissions and pays a carbon tax on its electricity and on its energy. What we do not have in the carbon, uh, in the carbon pricing system is biological emissions. And in my view, the not only do we have an issue about carbon leakage in terms of other countries, but until such time as we are getting outside of the laboratory into the marketplace, some of these technologies that are now being developed, partly because of the commitment of this government to putting serious effort into R&D in this area, putting a price on carbon is not, a is not an incentive to switch to less carbon intensive activities. It's simply a tax that will achieve no effects other than depress production. Whereas there is logic, I would argue, uh, uh, Jamie, in areas where there are alternative technologies outside biological emissions in having the whole concept of, of a price on carbon. We are trying to incentivize, admittedly it's a very weak incentive at current prices, but we're trying to incentivize that shift. Can I just respond to that too? Yes, uh, but in the meantime, please get your questions ready. Um, in terms of agriculture, I don't think the carbon leakage argument is as, as simple as, as um, both Act and National are making out. I think part of the premium that New Zealand commands is based on the fact that it's New Zealand production. Uh, that land can't go offshore, so I think just assuming that putting a price on is going to drive all our dairying off to another country uh, that has lower cost of production, I don't think it's that simple at all. Uh, secondly, I... Uh, um, I think it's a great thing that we're putting a lot of research into greenhouse gas emission reductions. Uh, my honours degree was in agricultural science and I don't th I think the chance of us finding a silver bullet in terms of scientific research for agricultural emissions is very, very small. Uh, I think if we do find that silver bullet, it's likely to be genetically modified and that opens a whole other can of worms uh, that, that, and another debate that, that um, New Zealanders have had in the past and I suspect will go the same way uh, in the future. And the third thing I would, uh, point I would make is coming back to the point I made in, in my 10 minute speech, uh, which is actually one of the biggest issues we have with agriculture, and I acknowledge that they do pay um, a, a price on carbon on their fuel and, and on their electricity. One of the biggest problems we have is that the obligation point for agriculture is not set at the farm level. Now that would be very difficult to do. But what that means is an individual farmer, and, and uh, there are a number of farmers who are engaging in very good practices, new and innovative ways of farming, uh, they don't see the reward for that because it's all averaged out at the processor level. Now we acknowledge that that, that is a, a problem for agriculture, that's why the complementary measures, rather than simply once again just fixating on the price of carbon as being the be-all and end-all of how, how we deal with our emissions, the complementary measures of how we can work with the agricultural sector to reward those good practices, you know, a number of farmers could offset nearly all, of the, nearly all if not all, of their emissions by planting on marginal land, uh, but the tracts of, of forest that they would do would not be big enough to qualify them for the ETS, so I think I just think there's a range of, of positive ways we can work with the agricultural sector to, to bring down and also to mitigate their emissions. It doesn't just have to be about the price on carbon. Maybe I, I think I didn't make my point as clearly as I, I thought it was quite clear, but um, think of it like this, I think. It's way of, suppose we are a tiny ship on a great ocean. We can't affect what happens in global emissions. What we can do is make our little ship more seaworthy. So if we, um, if we become a richer nation, we will be better able to adapt to whatever, make whatever adaptations we need to make in the face of dangerous trends caused by climate change. That's the sensible strategy for a small country that cannot influence the global trends to take. It is reckless to put yourself at an economic disadvantage as a gesture uh, try, of trying to hold back the tide when you can't do it. You should be devoting yourselves to getting 
ahead, to getting stronger, to be better able to deal with what's coming. Thank you, Jamie. Can I throw the, uh, the floor open to, to questions now? Who's going to go first? Looks like it's going to be me. Oh, here we are, over here. So Anne Smith, um, Environmental Solutions, part of Landcare Research. Um, the question I have is, um, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Ireland, Scotland all have similar populations to New Zealand and similar footprints. All of those countries are striving to reduce their emissions. All of those countries are benefiting economically from the measures they've put in place to reduce emissions. Why is, is New Zealand saying that they can make no difference if all of those countries took the same attitude as New Zealand, the combined emissions of those six countries would be significant to the global economy and the global emissions. Uh, well, I don't accept the underlying premise that we're not taking this seriously. Um, and uh, secondly, I know um, that their carbon footprints are dramatically different from New Zealand's. One, Ireland's has some similarity because 20% or no, a little, I think it's a bit more than 20%, about 22% of their emissions come from agriculture compared with 49% for New Zealand. But I'm sorry, the carbon footprints of those countries with the same size populations, more or less, as us, is dramatically different. And we are taking this seriously. We have got the only now, as far as I know, the only nationwide price on carbon, now that Australia is effectively walked away from its policy, outside Europe. And, you know, we are doing a lot internationally. The news people call New Zealand in the international negotiations the ideas factory on the negotiating framework. We're contributing a great deal to the global negotiations. No, I was just going to say that um, it, there are, can be economic benefits of shifting to, let's say, uh, renewable energy. It depends entirely on the price. Right? So it could be, I would imagine, actually, that over time, renewable energies are going to get cheaper and fossil fuel-based energy is going to get more expensive. And when, as that happens, people will automatically shift. Uh, that, that's how markets work. The question is whether the shift should be... Uh, in kind of coerced or encouraged through taxes and so on. And I can't understand, I mean, I, I don't know the statistics you're talking about, but I honestly can't understand how countries can be enriched by that kind of coercion. I can see how they could be enriched by shifting if they're responding to normal market prices, but otherwise I, don't, I honestly don't understand. I mean, maybe you can just tell me after the break or something, but I, I, I don't get it. I think there are enormous risks if we don't start to make this transition that, that aren't being taken seriously enough. Uh, and I think every country has their own challenges in terms of their... Uh uh, in terms of reducing emissions, uh, we actually have a lower cost of transition because we have a higher level of renewable energy, uh, because we have carbon sinks. Actually, that transition is, is a bit easier for New Zealand. We face other challenges, but uh, electricity generation in, in many countries is a major, major challenge, and they are taking big steps. We have to look at what uh, the major challenges facing us and address them, because actually the risk to our economy of not doing it, this is no longer just about climate change and the environment. This is actually about future-proofing our economy. Just quickly, um, I think the question is well put. Um, I've I lived in four of those countries in Europe over the years. Uh, after I was at Warsaw at the last UN conference. After that, I made a study tour through eight European countries, all of the ones pretty much that you not Ireland, the others, and discussed climate policy with them. I, and the c two things: one, they have an underlying they have had, for the better part of two decades, an underlying cross-party consensus that climate change was for real since 1990. And they introduced, leading with Denmark, but the other, Norway, the other countries, they introduced specific carbon taxes and other um, policy measures, renewable wind with Denmark and so on, in the early 90s. They, got a, they stole a march on the rest of the world. That laid the basis for two decades of rational planning Cohe social cohesion, more or less. You argue at the margin between parties, but the underlying consensus is there, which appears to be lacking, and I say this more in sorrow than anger with, between National and Green, and, um, than there is in New Zealand. 
it's become a political football heel, which is why we want an independent climate commission to try to depoliticize some of this. And, uh, you know, I mean, in our better moments, I think Tim and I would simply agree that our differences are really over the pace at which we should go. But my contention is that the scientists tell us we virtually, we're between a rock and a hard place. We have very little time, and therefore, we bring in these more, what he would call dra drastic policies, we would call necessary. And we would say they are feasible as long as we stay, keep social cohesion, they will be feasible. And just to get to the specific point, you know, um, National, in the form of Tim, uh, critique the work we've done. We relied on Burl for our initial dairy number crunching and so on. Fair enough. We also relied on parliamentary library research and other economists as well. And if there, are if, there are, if there are disagreements over the number crunching, which is really all it's about, then, well, why don't we just have a challenge here? Why don't we just set up uh, so either a cross-party or an independent commission to study all the work we've done, the government? We made ours transparent. We published our bill report. Where's the government work on which these decisions are made? So let's set up an independent working group to study all of this and come, because we desperately need an underlying consensus underpinning climate policy, and it needs a stronger cross-party support. Uh, Jan Bench, I, I noticed a couple of people mentioned energy, and I should see a thing. E energy efficiency as being an ancillary policy to um, carbon and climate change. What do each of the parties have in mind to bring energy efficiency more to the fore as a policy driver, just as it is being used in that way in Europe and, and in other overseas jurisdictions? Thanks. A, qu a quick word each. Well, I think absolutely it, this is a win-win, and uh, this is why there is a role for complementary policies. So what we've done, uh, from off the top of my head, I may have the details of this a little wrong, but we have identified an issue around vehicle fleets. Um, a surprisingly large percentage of new cars that are bought in New Zealand are bought by people that run fleets rather than individuals. So we're already starting to think about working with the people who make the operational decisions uh, in that space. Secondly, we work with uh, these people on um, energy efficiency uh, opportunities. Simon Bridges, I think, made a speech recently about two months ago on this. And we've got down to the most obscure thing that n I never heard of before, which is something to do with changing the size of the tyres. It has a measurable impact on um, efficiency and therefore saves carbon and saves uh, money. So I think there are, um, there is scope for energy efficiency. And of course, if we go outside New Zealand, there's, this is one of the keys to global action. If we look at China, I just happen to have this figure on my head. In the last five-year plan, finishing I think in 212 or 211, I can't remember the end date, the China saved um, on energy efficiency per unit of GDP output about 19.5% energy increase in efficiency. And while that made perfect economic sense, the World Bank estimated that that saved the equivalent of 1.45 billion tons of CO2e that would have otherwise gone into the atmosphere in addition to China's emissions. So there is absolutely a very close equation here between energy efficiency and uh, climate change action. <coughs> well, I, I think you see here the difference between the National Party and the ACT Party. Uh, the uh, people have an already have an economic incentive to increase uh, efficiency, energy efficiency, up to the point where the cost of increasing it exceeds the, the benefits, right, the, the savings. So there's no need for the government to get involved in this. People already have an incentive uh, to use energy efficiently. If governments get involved, what's likely to happen is that the amount spent on increasing the efficiency Will be th that'll be subsidised, it'll be directed politically, it'll go to friends of government ministers. Oh, you know, when I say friends, I mean ideological friends. Of I'm not suggesting anything corrupt. Um, and uh, it'll just all be a bit of a mess. And there's no need for it, because as I say, people already have a perfectly good incentive uh, to improve their, their energy efficiency. 
Um, well, I completely disagree with that. I think this is a really exciting area um, and an area that we should put a lot more focus on. Um, some people do have the choice and the ability to access energy efficient goods and services. Uh, lower income people uh, do not. They often have to make those short term decisions that I talked about uh, earlier. I think there's a lot of regulatory uncertainty for lines companies in dealing with energy efficiency. I think lines companies are perfectly poised to really take the charge in this area. They have a vested interest in reducing the load across their uh, network at peak times to avoid costly upgrades uh, and that also reduces the, the cost of electricity and means we don't turn on those thermal peaking stations. Uh, in our last year of government, we changed part four of the Commerce Act to ensure that energy efficiency, uh, that, that sorry, the Commerce Commission must provide incentives for energy efficiency and provide no disincentives, but unfortunately that's not a priority for them at the moment, so no work has been done. So that means, in terms of their price path, a lot of lines companies are really worried about going down the path of energy efficiency, because if it affects their return, uh, then they get pinged by the Commerce Commission. It's really hard to predict without a few years of modelling uh, what uh, uh, the uptake and the use of energy efficiency measures are going to mean for their price path. So that work needs to be done. Simple things also, you know, um, Vector have got this great Sun Genie product for distributed generation. That's fantastic. They've gone out on a limb doing that because we don't know whether the PV panels, the battery storage are actually part of their asset and they're not allowed to invest in it and, and if they aren't. So just addressing that regulatory uncertainty and unleashing uh, the ability within the lines companies to do that work I think would be a great start. If we can, I'm from Gisborne. If we could get more distributed generation uh, in places like Gisborne, that would increase the efficiency. It it can't just be a debate about what the next power station is going to be, uh, uh, what the fuel stock for the next power station is going to be. It has to also be about squeezing every value, every unit of value out of every unit of electricity that we have going across our network. And that's why a good thing about the NZ Power Policy is it also allows demand side uh, solutions to uh, to bid in when there's increased demand for electricity generation, not just new power plants. So we could go on for a lot longer, but I, I think this is a really exciting area. Yeah, I don't have a lot to add. There's a certain amount of uh, commonality here between national, green labour and national policies, I think. Um, the, certainly the Greens promoted the home insulation scheme uh, with labour initially and then continued it under national, under a memorandum of understanding with national. So there's home insulation. Uh, the, we promoted uh, grants for solar panels, S um, PVCs. Uh, and as I said earlier in the introductory remarks, uh, we've got schemes for um, solar in schools and, uh, and also car em emissions um, efficiency as well. Thank you all. Um, can I invite uh, Professor Dave Frame, whom I've managed to introduce very poorly before. Dave is the director of the New Zealand Climate Change Research Institute at Victoria. Uh, he's going to give us a bit of a, a feel for how he leaves the uh, panel answer the questions. Great. Thanks. Um, well, it's kind of hard to sum up all that in, in about five minutes because Brian's going to have a go as well. Um, I've sort of been charged with thinking more of the international dimensions. One of the things I'd say is that I think it's really encouraging in New Zealand that um, we have, Ken just made the point, a, a surprising perhaps level of um, bipartisanship across the Greens, Labour and National about broad goals. Um, and that's pretty, that's actually, if I can use the word, pretty unique in, um, in the Anglophone world where most other uh, English speaking countries have a lot more um, climate denial and, um, and uh, ide deliberate ideological confusion about the issue. So I think that's something that we ought to, ought to kind of cherish really. Um, but it does, it, the ETS isn't my realm, but it does make me wonder why go back on the structural issue and, and Repoliticise the issue by moving away from the ETS when we have it. Surely, you know, the obvious thing to do is to strengthen it if that's if that's where, you, where you're at. Uh, the second, I've only got five minutes, so I'm going to try and make one point a minute. Uh, the second point is Tim said something about there being an academic debate about how you compare gases that was really just for academics, but I actually think it's not just for academics. I think, right, yeah, cool. Um, so, <laughs> so it's the reason it's not academic is because if you compare the gases. The, a kilogram of methane against a kilogram of CO2 and you use this metric called uh, global warming potential, which is the way we do it in Kyoto, you get a value about 25. It's comparing the heating effect, the radiative forcing, time integrated radiative forcing of these kilograms of gas. If you compare the temperature effects over the same time horizon, so 100 years later, it drops to about 5 or 6, roughly. Now that is purely an accounting choice and it has major policy implications because we heard it said several times here that New Zealand is one of the highest emitting countries in the world. But that's only true if you use the 
the GWP approach. And, uh, and, and within the physical science literature, within the climate research literature, you'll see a range of perspectives, but you'll see a lot, there's, a, there's an increasing amount of evidence coming through that maybe a switch would be a good idea. Now, um, that would benefit New Zealand if um, it turns out to be hard to do anything about methane. It would, if, if, if it's easy to do something about methane, then sticking with GWP and um, looking like we're descending faster, right, would be, would be the self-interested thing to do. But it's a debate that does matter and it has real policy consequences. Uh, the third point is a lot of this turns on contingent versus unilateral action, whether or not you think that New Zealand ought to act alone or, um, you know, this, uh, or, or, or base its action on what other people do. Um, and in New Zealand, you frequently get conversations that have a slightly... New Zealand's a bit schizophrenic about this. When it suits us, we describe ourselves as a little nation that could, and when it suits us, we say we're too small to matter. Um, and, and I don't think there's any particular... I think, you know... Parties and um, you know people in the in public life deploy those framings depending on whether it, it, it suits broadly speaking, but I think at the limits you can ask you know what would it take Ken for instance if we did go out on our own and really push on this if we had twenty years of no action by anyone else what would you guys do would you turn around and go back um, uh, and then equally Jamie if if through some you know uh, Institutional redesign, presumably, we can solve the uh, the uh, the enforcement and participation issues, and the rest of the world does start to move. At what point would ACT think this was a good idea to to be on this on this? Uh I was avoiding that word actually. <laughs> right. So, but okay. Right. So, um, and two other points. Uh, Right, okay, I've, I've made that one. Um, the, the other one was really on, um, there's, a, there's multiple things uh, climate research can say in response to the information that we've heard today. W one of the ones I wanted to make to an earlier questioner is one of the reasons that Norway, Denmark and Scotland might have incentives to reduce their um, uh, emissions and, and get really into this game is because of declining North Sea reserves. And in general, the countries that have made the, the that have had steep reductions have been in those kind of positions where those those steep, those steep declines were kind of, had a big tailwind. Um, and paying attention to other people's national circumstances is really important as you go to shape policy, because otherwise you end up saying, I want to be like that guy, and that guy is nothing like you. Um, Jamie said a couple of things that I think um, we could push back on. Um, the IPCC has linked various extreme weather events to climate change. Um, the, it, there are some it doesn't, tropical cyclones for instance. Um, there are... There are some it does, so extreme precipitation events, for instance, um, there's a lot of work going on in, um, uh, I can give you the papers if you like, um, and they are cited in IPCC. Um, I agree with you that there is a disproportionate focus on costs and not benefits, and I think that's a pathology in the literature that as the literature matures, hopefully we, you know, we'll, we'll address. Um, okay. Uh, and the final point was really about um, adaptation, and I think Moana was the only one to really mention adaptation and the uh, central government having a, a strong role in that. Um, I'm probably starting to infringe on, on uh, Brian's turf, but, but, uh, but even those of you who don't think that a deal is possible ought to think that we ought to be better prepared in the future, uh, and that investments in long-term infrastructure, for instance, if, if, if a major, you know, many of our major roads are um, uh, along... Um, beside the sea, if, there's, if there is substantial sea level rise, you could have problems. If there's erosion and other things, there could, there could be problems there. So, but, uh, you know, it seems a bit of a no-brainer that even if you, especially if you think that other countries aren't going to do anything, then you're going to have to adapt more. Right, with that I'll pass over to Brian. Um, thank you, Dave. And forgive me if this is slightly more uh, micro and mean-spirited. Um, but if I could start with Minister Gross's comments, what a, and forgive me if this is a caricature of your position, it seems to be we're a tiny share of global emissions and um, business often asks why should we incur costs that our competitors don't face, why sh isn't it sufficient to have a kind of placeholder for a carbon price that we can fill in with something meaningful when the rest of the world gets serious about the issue, is that not too far from your position? Okay, well, the, it's a fair question, but I think the answer to it lies in the fact that our emissions, and 
if you can get the rest of the world to agree you know, on methane, that would be great. But as it stands, we are the fifth highest uh, Annex I country in emissions per capita. We don't have the fifth highest GDP per capita. We have uh, an economy whose emissions intensity is about one third higher than the United States, more than twice Western European level. So the, the competitiveness question, I think, has a temporal dimension that if we simply wait until the rest of the world does get serious about pricing carbon and internalising this external cost, then we're starting from a disadvantageous position in terms of, of competitiveness. I also have um, an issue with the government's position on the 5% by 2020 target, given that we're currently in gross emissions terms 20-something percent above that, um, and apparently, according to the, uh, the government's own national communications, forests uh, will flip from being a net sink to a net source sometime between uh, 2017 and 2023. So there is, a, I would have thought, a, a credibility well, issue. Exactly the well, okay, but there is a credit, you know, there is a, a difficulty there. Um, with, with Dr. White, um, what it sounded to me like you were saying that you know getting any sort of meaningful global agreement is going to be fiendishly difficult for the leakage and other uh, reasons you gave. But with any luck, the costs won't be as great as we fear. Anyway, my concern would be, what if they are? I mean, there's, there's an issue here of tail risks um, and long physical lags. And so there's, a, um, I think, an ethical question about what risks we are entitled to run there in the light of the uncertainty. But I also have a more um, specific qu act-related question. If you're the party that respects property rights and you want to get rid of the ETS, there are apparently, according to officials, 140 million New Zealand units in the registry not held by the government. Uh, their holders have either bought them or retained them at some opportunity cost. Would you compensate them? And if so, at what price and at what fiscal cost? Um, on the issue of, of adaptation, I, I, I've never understood the argument that there's some kind of choice between mitigation and adaptation. We have, we have no option but to adapt to however much climate change there turns out to be. But how much there turns out to be surely depends on mitigation efforts. And finally, you, you talked about you know, that, that technological, technology whose time has come will happen with normal market pricing. But I would struggle to find an economist who doesn't think that we should internalise external costs. And if you don't do that, you have something tantamount to a subsidy. In this case, flowing from poor countries to rich ones and from future generations to the present. Um, with, with Moana, uh, the... If it's your policy to make the ETS fit for purpose, I'm not sure that the suite of changes that you've outlined will do that, partly because of the overhang issue. There's huge uncertainty about how, what the balance of supply and demand in the market will look like, given how co completely ERUs have crowded out NZUs. So there's some serious design issues, I would have thought, to make um, the ETS work. Um, and, and uh, nevertheless, I, I, I see the point that both uh, Tim Grosser and you make about the desirability in terms of structure to preserve something that does have some bipartisan support, even if we, we have installed this plumbing, um, even if there's no or very little flowing through the pipes at the moment, to completely scrap it and start afresh, when there does seem to be an international trend in favour of market mechanisms rather than tax, um, seems like a suboptimal choice. That's really all I have. Thank you, Brian. <laughs> no, no, Dave, you can't say anything else. I'm sorry. Thank you all. It's been a great debate. I, I, there are a number of questions which I wanted to ask, which I don't have time to, um, but I might try and grab you a drinks. Penny Nelson, I ask you to give a vote of thanks. Thank you, Patrick. On behalf of the Business New Zealand Energy Council and the Sustainable Business Council, I'd just like to say thank you very much to all of the panel. One of the things that both of our members said to us before the election was that um, this was an, a priority issue for them and that they really wanted to have um, a good discussion with a, a range of parties on it. So um, I really feel like today um, you've all had a, had a really good say and um, given us some real food for thought on some of the, the questions that um, we had. Patrick, thank you for chairing it. I think you've done a great job. Um, we were really keen to ensure that 
people felt it was they had a chance to really um, say what they thought and, it, and an independent person running it. So you've, you've done that superbly, thank you. Dave and Brian, really appreciate you providing your commentary. A um, number of things in there I'm keen to follow up with you afterwards, so I'm, I'm sure other members were, um, will, will as well. So that, I, I think there is a lot of room for further discussion um, over drinks. David, I'd just like to say thank you to Becca for hosting today. It's fantastic that we're doing it in a site where we can video conference into Wellington because not, not everyone could be here today, so thank you for that. Um, and finally, please stay and join us for drinks and something to eat and more discussion. I feel like we've, we're just starting to get into it, so please stay on in both Auckland and Wellington. <laughs>